Chris, I, I told um I told Carrie this before uh, you got on the Zoom, but I'm mm-hmm. um, trying something different tonight, which I haven't done in a very long time. Okay. If I may inaugurate it with a sound. Oh, there we go. <laughs> yeah, there he That's is. A nice sound. There's our guy. That's a nice sound. <laughs> I just I don't know. You know, maybe it's you know fucking twentieth anniversary of nine eleven or whatever, and you know it's just you know we're at the um... any plans? Any plans for nine eleven? <laughs> we're gonna go back to um, Mission Barbecue, the troop, the troop barbecue. Oh, restaurant. really? We, we went there last really? year on nine yeah, eleven. I actually really... love Mission Barbecue. <laughs> yeah, it was it's really, really something. good. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's okay. It's it's like okay as far as barbecue goes. I, I I'm more in there for the ambiance, you know. Of course, of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I got I got like a um I spent like five dollars last year for like a um like a special nine eleven commemorative cup, and then I think I lost it. I don't think I ever saw it again. So I got to get another one. You got Maybe to have a twentieth anniversary a commemorative. commemorative cup. Yeah. yeah. Oh. I'm trying something what new too. Beer. I'm not drinking. Mm. So. See, I'll 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 take up for yeah. you here. I don't know. I just felt like um, you know, I wanted to be disorganized and uh, go on tangents. So uh, That's how you do it. Why not have a few and why not have a few brews? And what a what a pour, man. Oh, beautiful, we're beautiful right pour. Now. Look at that, huh? <laughs> I'm not a I'm not like a beer guy. Like I don't I'm not into like IPAs and whatever. I'm happy with a fucking lager or, you know, a pilsner like this is. No, 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 no big deal. And honestly, it's it's mostly just, you know, I realized that this uh this week I was like I tend to stick to like liquor because it's a heartburn factor i think i just fucking get heartburn if i just like drink wine or beer on an empty stomach and some people say oh dwight you know might as well eat something but uh you know that's inefficient it's very cute that you like poured it into a glass i've never done that at home i just like will drink from a can so it's very i'm honest too so so okay look i was like i was like I had I had watched this YouTube thing that was said something about how, you know, you're supposed to pour it into a glass because it's the right thing with bubbles and the fucking taste and stuff like that. Mm. And you're just going to like burp the night away if you don't pour it into the thing. And sometimes even like if I do, if I am drinking from the can, I'll swirl it a little bit to like kind of get some of the bubbles out. Is that weird? No, that's totally normal. I don't think normal. that's weird. No, that's normal. Yeah. I think that's normal. All right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Listen, I would man, pour just... it into the glass a lot of times for the same reason, Um, because that's yeah, I think that's kind of part of my opposition to beer is just it's just too heavy too much fucking carbonation and shit you know exactly yeah, i'm not a big beer person either if my, my memoir is going to be called a man and his gird <laughs> <laughs> i was thinking about that too like with the uh we were talking about that on last week's patreon about like the fucking complete lie that we're told that like oh medical technology gets better every year and so you're just gonna your your generation's gonna live to 120 see i'm already fucking battling you can hear it uh <laughs> your generation's battling. gonna live to 120 <laughs> and i'm like <laughs> and it's like yeah i mean the mark the maybe the mark zuckerbergs of our generation yeah not me or yeah Fucking Jeff, Be- <laughs> Jeff Bezos just made his, you know, like a, a live long company or a fucking, you know, a, a, they're going to cryogenically freeze his organs or whatever. It oh, is. really? But it's like, the, yeah, he just, yeah, it just announced that he's making a company to do like longevity science. Very or topical. That's what Larry Ellison is mostly invested in. But of course, of <laughs> course they would want like, like I thought I thought about this the other day because like, you know, I, I've seen I, I remember watching this like documentary from like the 40s on on people that live a long time. And there was this woman that was like, she had had like nine kids, they're older, and her husband has been dead for like 15 years or something. She was like 95 or something. And the interview was like, you know, what are you looking forward to? She was just like, I've had enough. (laughs) (laughs) Me too. But I think... But that's but that's the thing. Like I think the compulsion for these for these fucking psycho billionaires is that like it will never be enough. Sure. Because life is just so crazily good for them. Sure. Because like when you're wielding so much of that power, like I don't know what it is about us as a species or whatever, but like you just can't you they just don't want this to stop. They don't want this train to end. I always thought when I was a kid that I would want to be like cryogenically frozen and then brought back like five hundred years later just to see what it's like. And then when I was in my teens, I saw some documentary where like a scientist was like, you can't make a cow out of hamburger meat. And I was like, so <laughs> bummed out about it. And then I like started crying. Jesus. <laughs> That's fucked up. <laughs> That's so fucked it's, up. It's true though. So, you know, while Zuckerberg or whoever is investing in like freezing their brain or whatever, just know that it's never going to work. You know, you can't do it. God. <laughs> You're just gonna have to be fucking just uh, enjoy eternity like the rest of us. That's right. In hell, see you in hell, for, buddy. In hell, in their case, yeah. Fuck you. Fuck not me. I'm going. I'm going to heaven. Actually, <laughs> yeah. Chris is going to heaven. You are. Yeah. yeah. You are. Yeah. Yeah. No. This is 
sweet boy. He's an angel. I know. <laughs> All right, let's crack the second beer. <laughs> let's, let's get it. <laughs> now when I was a young boy, about the age of five, my teachers taught me I could be the greatest man alive. They told me I could change the world, be whatever I wanted to be. There was no one in the world like me. Every one of us was so unique. I'd not be an average man. No, sir, I'd be no average man. So I have those big dreams. Welcome back, everyone, to Eat the Rich. This is a show about our political economy, late stage capitalism, and the millionaires, billionaires, and multinational corporations hell bent on staving off his death rattle. I'm Dwight, and today we have with us Chris. Hello. And we've got Carrie. Hello. So this uh, this is one that we really needed to... Oh, sorry. I, I meant to uh, crack the second beer. Yeah, you got it, man. Go for it. I'm so go sorry. Off. Hang on one second. Oh, there and we let's go. Let's see that beautiful pour. <laughs> That's right. So um, wh- while I'm doing that, yeah, I mean, this is, this is one of the ones that I feel like we needed to check off the list because he is, I think, uh, as of now, he's the seventh richest person in the world. Uh, on the books, at least. And um, we needed to talk about him because he's, you know, he's that Goliath uh, behind Oracle. His name is Larry Ellison. He's a name you're probably he- you've probably heard of a lot, but not a guy that, like, stirs up a lot of, like, outward drama and stuff like that. He's not, like, funding, you know, psycho right-wing projects and shit like that. Or well, is he? The, uh, well, on the, yeah. On the outside <laughs> he of gave it. money well, to Ron Paul. We'll, we'll get to that. Ron Paul, yeah. Yeah. Not, not the obvious ones, at least. Um, <laughs> uh but now the, the part of the reason that I'm like having a few beers is that like it almost to me feels like, uh, you know, more insidious because of the things that we're going to learn today um, and looking into his background. Because I was like, is there really a lot on this guy? I mean, it just seems a little bit undramatic. And boy, was I fucking wrong. So uh, let me just uh, take a look at the beer. It seems pretty <laughs> fine. Uh, again, not a beer guy. So don't get all weird and technical about it and shit like that. It's just a goddamn Everybody beverage. calm reasonably down. Priced. Everybody <laughs> calm down. All right. It's just a beer. <laughs> I don't have really a problem. Me. Let's, let's talk dry martinis. Man. That's really where I come alive. I, th- I think uh, I think part of the reason why it feels like we don't know that much about Larry Ellison just like through culture is because like his heyday was probably when we were like kids, right? Like now the big ones right. are like Zuckerberg and Bezos, and those guys are the ones all in the news. But I, we're not going to cover this anywhere else. But like he's had work done, right? Oh yeah. I mean, they all have, but yeah, yeah of course. I mean, he's seventy-seven. Yeah. He, he, yeah it, what it explicitly says in many of the articles that I read, it like it always they always mention his nose job. Yeah. Oh really? Yeah. Which oh I think yeah. He had I didn't, quite I didn't young, notice yeah. that. Yeah. I just yeah. I see that now. Yeah. Because like I think I rem- when when you said that about you know how you know when you know we uh, just not in the heyday that he was uh you know because we were a bit younger. I like I remember seeing pictures of him as a kid and being like something's off. Like, there's just something like slightly uncanny valley about this guy. Sure. And I think that's probably what it is now. It's like I'm seeing some eye work, definitely some cheek fillers. <laughs> uh, We're going to do like and, a People you know, magazine cover of like his face pointing out all the places where he's had work done. The, <laughs> that's right. The dude was way ahead of the time with the chin strap, too. I got to give him credit for that. <laughs> I don't know if he was listening to Godsmack as the reason, but uh, you know, <laughs> it's, a good, it's just different generation. It's a, it's a good look, you know. Oh yeah. So his so he didn't grow up with his um his biological parents. His biological dad was an Italian American. Hey. Uh, his mother was Jew. Hey. His mother was Jewish. Um, his upbringing was not terribly remarkable. Although I do want to say that the name Ellison came apparently from his uh, adoptive father, who had that name as a tribute to Ellis Island, as was the, you know, as really? his family came into it. Yeah. Oh. So it's literally just like Ellison, like, <laughs> I guess, the son of Ellis Island or whatever. Interesting. Whatever. Whatever. It's fine. Curious. Um, so he had, he had a, a, like a weirdly unremarkable early career in which he was working for a co- corporation called Ampex, um, which did some kind of database stuff. Like that's, that's his big, uh, uh, you know, claim to fame is like working on databases, which in fairness, like in the 1970s was like relatively revolutionary stuff, right? You can take a large amount of data, you know, then what was a large amount of data and put it into a organizable format that can be, you know, query. To me, it's nothing. Um, you see, it's that's, so easy. And, and this is why I'm so pleased. <laughs> Just I'm kidding. so pleased that we have like an actual engineer on board here because like, I think, man, I think it like literally my first job 
I used isn't Microsoft Access uh, like a yeah, database that's what it, that's their program database or something? System. And I think that's like that's like a sequel, something like that. Like, I don't fucking <laughs> understand this entirely. Yeah, I know my way around Excel, but I don't know. This I gotta fucking uh, put my yeah, glasses you gotta on step for this up, one. Step up on me there. You gotta learn to code. Yeah, I should <laughs> learn to code. I'm gonna uh, write a letter to um, Nancy Pelosi and ask her for a scholarship. Uh, but uh, yeah, anyway. So long story short, he ended up. Um, forming a company in 1977 that ended up becoming Oracle. But what was the iteration that created Oracle? And for that, I'm going to read, uh, I think this that we're going to read into this from like actually piece it from a, a few different articles. But the this 2014 Business Insider article uh, by Julie Bort says it all. And I think you'll understand why I'm having a beer because this is just like, you know, some gut wrenching stuff. The title of this article from Business Insider is Larry Ellison is a billionaire today. Thanks to the CIA. <laughs> God bless him. <laughs> I can't help but I can't help but smile when I hear that because I didn't I didn't like when I started looking into this I just didn't even fucking realize it and here we are it reads as follows the CIA was a customer that launched Oracle co-founder Larry Ellison said on stage Sunday night during the opening uh, keynote for the company's massive customer service conference uh, in uh, excuse me massive customer conference in San Francisco our very first customer was the Central Intelligence Agency he said he and his co-founder sort of tricked the world into buying their first database by not naming it version 1.0 as was the norm back in the day the very first version was Oracle version 2 he said we knew that no one would want to buy version 1 lo and behold the CIA was our first customer the CIA dumb as hell they That's totally <laughs> fell for it <laughs> That you know, that's your that's your uh, tax dollars at work. Uh, pretty pretty uh. stunning stuff. And so to flesh this out, I'm going to skip over to a um, to another article about this, uh, which was from Gizmodo, which was actually a pretty comprehensive article uh, by Matt Novak from 2014 called again Larry Ellison's Oracle started as a CIA project. And so I'm just going to read a little uh, further into this where it goes a little bit more in depth. And it's interesting. It starts out as a criticism of Vox. It says, yesterday, Vox somehow managed to write an entire article about the history of Oracle and its founder, Larry Ellison, without mentioning the CIA even once. Imagine that. Imagine that. Imagine, imagine that. that. Yeah, I guess that doesn't certainly doesn't indicate that they're also on the payroll. No, no, no. I wouldn't yeah, say of so. Course not. I, I, I don't get that at all from this, which is pretty astounding, given the fact that Oracle takes its name from a 1977 <laughs> CIA project code name. So again, you know, and it explains that it, Vox uh, simply says the ar the Oracle was uh, founded in late late 1970s and quote sells a line of software products that help large and medium sized bit companies manage their operations. True, but the article continues. It somehow ignores the fact that Oracle has always been a significant player in the national security industry, and that its founder would not have made his billions without helping to build the tools of our modern surveillance state. So it goes on to say. It's not to say that Oracle's work with the U.S. government should necessarily be frowned upon. Mm, it should. I might disagree with that, but um, the CIA needs databases just like any large organization. But not mentioning just oh. how reliant or right, not mentioning just how reliant Oracle has been on government contracts since its inception is downright strange and seems to feed this narrative that Ellison simply created a product that companies wanted and private enterprise did the rest. Which I have to maybe critique the framing of this article a little bit, which is kind of saying like, you have to rely on the government to give you money and not just rely on the marketplace, mm. which is ridiculous because like nearly all of our like large scale industries can be looked back at as, you know, having been fostered by the US government. Yeah, Fuck, the yeah. entire banking industry would have collapsed and dissolved in 2008 if it weren't for the uh, US government and our tax dollars bailing them out. And I didn't look into it, but everything seemed fine after that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it says, uh, Ellison has always been a big believer in the federal government maintaining large national databases, and he was able to be much more public about it in the months after the September 11th attacks. That's why I thought it was like prescient for us to be talking about this now. In mm -hmm. fact, Ellison argued that we needed just one large national security database, one with national ID cards and mandatory iris scans, naturally. Okay. Very cool. Very he cool. Said, this is a quote of Larry Ellison in the New York Times in January 2002. So keep in mind, this is just, you know, four months after 9-11. The single greatest step we Americans could take to make life tougher for terrorists would be to ensure that all the information in myriad government databases was copied into a single comprehensive national security database. 
Creating such a database is technically simple. All we have to do is copy information from the hundreds of separate law enforcement databases into a single database. A national security database could be built in a few months, he explained. A national security database combined with biometrics, thumbprints, handprints, iris scans, or whatever is best can be used to detect people with false identities. <laughs> now, I just want to Did he stop- offer to, to do like the backend software for free? I feel like I remember reading that, that he just like offered it. He's like, I'll do it. Just like, let me. I don't, I don't remember <laughs> that but it's just funny to me because it's like just think about that like how fucking cynical this is and like this is like when you really get into like the capitalist mindset again for the guy that made his money and again this is 2002 that that he's talking from here the guy that made his money from from the from the u.s government okay so yeah so anyway it just the the framing of this seems so insane to me because again this is like four months after 9-11 and he is being a salesman like he he did an article in the New York Times to sell the idea of his it's an opinion piece from January 31st and it's it's uh, by Larry Ellison a, a national a uh, single national security database and like is he's being a salesman for his company in in the midst <laughs> of like everyone frothing at the mouth and freaking out and not knowing well, how are we going to do it how are we going to keep ourselves safe and he catapulted his own business mm-hmm. interest well has there been has there been another yeah. 911 so you know i didn't think you know, about that well maybe he had some uh, some ideas right so it's just crazy here so it continues in this article <laughs> this this Gizmodo article it says uh rosen uh jeffrey rosen in this uh book called the naked crowd reclaiming security and freedom in an anxious age it, oh, he says great. that uh 23 percent of oracle's licensing revenue in 2003 was from the u.s government from the federal government it was 2.5 billion dollars uh and so in the book uh he's talking to david carney who was a retired CIA after 32 years, hired by Oracle to be the head of the Information Assurance Center that was founded two months after the September 11 attacks. I can't like help. I can't help but like smile when I say this because it's just like it's so fucked up, man. It's like anyway. So so yeah. the book reads as follows: How do you say this without sounding callous? Carney asks. In some ways, 9/11 made business a bit easier. Previous to 9-11, you, had, uh, you pretty much had to hype the threat and the problem. Carney said that the summer before the attacks, leaders in the public and private sectors wouldn't sit still for a briefing. Then his face brightened. Now they clamor for it. That is insane to me. That, that's, yeah. that's, that's insane to me that they're using defining moment of American history, modern American history, by just saying like, yeah, it'd be good for business and we'll make sure that we do it. How'd they do it? Well, they hired a CIA guy to to sell it better because who's better who better to sell it than the guy that knows the fucking Right, the guys who did it, yeah. Operational Right. <laughs> exactly. Right. Um I just want to uh, read one more thing here about uh about their lobbying efforts uh and in with the, the CIA. And this was from a two so this is May two thousand two, um, from the San Francisco Gate. Where it reads, uh, the, the article title is, Oracle's coziness with the government goes back to its founding, firm's growth sustained as niche established with uh, federal and state agencies. And they, of course, you know, they go back through the, uh, the, the you know, the, the history of the fact that this Redwood City, California company has a cozy, uh, you know, software providing relationship with the CIA that went 25 years ago. That was 25 years ago, of course, in 2002, um, because they started in 1977. And they continue with this and they say, you know, a, an enormous amount, like we learned, the enormous amount of money went, came from the federal government. I'm sorry, if it sounds like I'm talking a little bit weird, there's like a slight delay with my my hearing of myself and my mic. I might just mute it. No, you sound good. You listen to yourself while you talk? Of, yeah, of course. Oh, well, I could not do that. Yeah, I didn't I know you did that. Possibly. No, yeah. that would drive me crazy. Like I've had that happen delay. as like an error and I, I can't have it. No, no, no. Yeah, it's... Uh... Yeah, like, <laughs> oh man, uh, that's that's yeah. uh, totally normal. It's normal stuff. <laughs> that's really normal. Really normal stuff, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, this is just this is just so crazy. So it, it continues here talking about like how it uh, you know courts the uh, the kind of local authorities that would need databases. So he talks about here donating money to school board 
members in the Los Angeles, you know, school board, uh, uh, school district says here, regardless, the timing of the contribution raises questions about whether Oracle has tried to help win some of its government contracts by making donations. Campaign disclosure forms, mm. for instance, show that the company gave a thousand dollars a piece to four Los Angeles school board members from March to June of last year. Valerie Fields, jo- uh, Jose Huizar, Joseph Tukovsky and Julie Korenstein. Fields uh, was defeated in the June election. A few months later, the Los Angeles Unified School District started buying Oracle software to warehouse vast amounts of records. The district said Curious. that it bought three two point three million dollars in software from March, excuse me, from August two thousand one through March of two thousand two, but that the school board members did not vote on those purchases. So of course, I'm sure that they just gave a thousand dollars out of the Goodness of their hearts. For sure. State records show that Oracle also gave $500 to Los Angeles County Sheriff Lee Baca in August. The sheriff's office has used Oracle software since 1999 to track criminal records, and Oracle touts it as one of its success stories. Oracle says the system is designed to support 10,000 terminals, including 2,000 logged on at once, and keep track of 500,000 arrests per year. Which is just like, it's like $500. Damn. Like, it's so inconsequential compared to, like, the rest of their business activities. It's like, it's almost cynical. It's like, yeah, we could give a lot more, but we don't, it doesn't even take that much to secure, you know, our business relationship with, you know, this municipality, or this right. police department. Uh, and I like this here. Of course, they talk about lobbying. Like many tech firms, Oracle has tried to boost its political clout at the national level in recent years. Last year, Oracle spent $2.3 million on lobbying, up from $900,000 in 1997, and was the computer industry's fifth biggest lobbyist, according to the Center for Responsive Politics in Washington. Um, In the past years, Oracle has also hired key Beltway insiders, including former top CIA official David Carey and former White House spokesman Joe Lockhart, who later quit after complaining about the hassles of shuttling between Washington, D.C. and Silicon Valley. Shut up. (laughs) For a while, the Valley was abuzz with rumors that Ellison was courting former President Bill Clinton. He loves Bill Clinton. He loves Bill Clinton. (laughs) It's like literally one of his idols. Who doesn't? Can you imagine? Yeah, I know. Can there's another, wait, there's like another one. I, wait, I'm trying to remember what the other one was. There was a. Um, oh yeah, even even more than that. Yeah, I, I specifically took this little blurb from a, a, an article that I that I'd read. Um, but yeah, he mentioned two of the people he most admires as Bill Clinton and Winston Churchill. <laughs> so, <laughs> can you That's imagine? That's real good. And it's just funny too. Like even I, just to put a cap on this CIA thing, you know, the uh, there's a, there's an article here. There's a, a blog post on Oracle's own blog on their website from May of last year called "Growing with Intelligence from the CIA to Oracle." And they go on a whole fawning thing about how lovely their you know uh, the team is doing this and there's challenges, but we rise to the occasion. Blah 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 blah. It's just like yeah, they don't. Hide it. No. And you just think about like the kinds of databases that needed to to arise as of you know as a result of uh nine eleven, which is like, you know, the no fly database. Sure. Right? You know, the no fly list, like that's hosted somewhere. Sure, yeah. So it's just it's pretty fucking it's pretty rough. <laughs> like, you know, again, when we I don't like it. No. Neither do I. But like, if you think about like who is profiting off of like this imperial project, like the American imperial project, yeah, it's fucking guys like this who have, you know, a 30 something percent share of his own company. And so he's killing it. He's fucking killing it. Yeah, absolutely. So as if being fabulously rich wasn't enough for Larry Ellison, uh, he wanted to be even more so and have to cheat the market to even do so. Uh, In 2005... Larry Ellison was hit with an insider trading lawsuit. And I'm going to read here from a 2005 article from New York Times by uh, Jonathan Glader called Oracle's Chief in Agreement to Settle Insider Trading Lawsuit. And it's a bit fucking funny because typically when we think about like, you know, insider trading, what that really means is, you know, in the market. And this is what the Securities Securities and Exchange Commission is built to do is to like monitor trades and see whether or not people are trading fairly. And one of the, the ways that people trade unfairly is in the market, you're supposed to be able to, you're supposed to trade on only things that are publicly available, public knowledge. Right. So meaning like, you know, uh, uh, you know, if there's a, uh, a earnings report that comes out and it's going to be good or it's going to be bad, 
Well, then you want to buy or short the stock based off of that, um, you know, stuff or, or, or divest of your holdings if you know that it's going to be bad. And I think there's supposed to be even like blackout periods that like executives and, and you know, uh, can't trade their shares, you know, if they're announcing a merger or acquisition or something like that. Funnily enough, of course, members of Congress that might be privy uh, to certain maybe a drug that's going to be approved by the FDA that they know because they're on a certain committee. That's OK. That is not illegal for them to trade on that information. So in case you know anybody mm-hmm. in Pelosi's office, let me know. I'm, uh, I'm looking for a hot, hot, hot tip. <laughs> um, so Larry Ellison, uh, even though he knows this. This is what happened. It said Lawrence J. Ellison, chief executive of Oracle, has reached a tentative agreement under which he would pay $100 million to charity to resolve a loss, a lawsuit charging that he engaged in insider trading in 2001, a lawyer said. Hmm, which charity is that? Great question. It said, <laughs> and, and this is, it's like, wait, what the fuck? Like, if you like defraud the public, you know, like in a public exchange or something, don't you think that that money should go to the public? But anyway, Mm. it said the unusual settlement, which requires the approval of Oracle's board, it could still break down, would be one of the largest payments made to resolve a shareholder suit of this kind, known as a derivative lawsuit. Derivative meaning like, you know, a a derivative of a a financial instrument. Typically in derivative lawsuits, damages are paid directly to the company, right? Like I made money off of this stock, and so I would give that money back to the stock or whatever. Under the terms of the settlement, Mr. Ellison would designate the charity and the payments to be made over five years would be paid in the name of Oracle, right? Fine. So it's like, hey, check from Oracle. It's unclear whether those payments would be tax deductible by Mr. Ellison. So they just, they went on 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 the up and the down, man. It's sick. The lawsuit charged that Mr. Ellison, known for his brash and combative pronouncements, sold almost $900 million of shares ahead of news that Oracle would not meet its expected earnings target. So he knew that they weren't doing so well, and he was going to make right. money. He was going to make sure that he kept as much of his money uh, while the stock was high before that information get, came out. The, st- yeah. the same amount of stock after the announcement was worth slightly more than half as much. So that earnings call fucking tanked. In fact, I wonder if I go to Google uh, Finance, if I could see the tank Damn. Yeah, there was a yeah, there was a sharp drop in 2001. I'm just like looking at the, you know, the the uh, stock price. Anyway, uh, according to the court docket for the case, which was filed in Superior Court in San Mateo, California, a hearing on the settlement, which requires court approval, is scheduled for September 26th. Under the terms of the agreement, the lawyers who brought the case for the shareholders would receive about twenty two point five million dollars separate from the one hundred million dollar payment. So just think about that. Mm. Just think about that. Like. He's out 122 grand, uh, 122 million dollars, mm-hmm. but he saved like 450 million dollars. So he's still yeah. up, like you know, 300 million some odd dollars. And by at this doing point, this. he's already a billionaire. Exactly. Anyway. It's so like it's so nuts. It's like nothing. <laughs> it's so crazy. <laughs> like he's just playing with amounts of money that to most people are just like unimaginable. My guess is that he probably knew that like he was gonna get smacked for this but like the calculation was like hey man this actually might be really bad and i'll just fucking i'll take the hit but i'll still be up yeah 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 that's that's just so fucking crazy i think i saw something too about like i don't know if he ended did he end up doing this doing the charity donation i'm trying to look for it now one of one of the things that came up when i was reading was that like there was some uh, conflict of interest because he donated a bunch of money to Stanford and then the people that he had like reviewing to see whether it was legal for him to do that or not were like at Stanford. <laughs> oh my so it was God. just like a web of, you know, can't bribery stop. and like deceit. Yeah. They can't stop, man. They can't stop. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'll, I'll relinquish shit to, to Chris now, but that's, uh, you know. It's just uh, good is not good enough, I guess. Hell yeah. No. Nope. So what, el- what else about his eccentricities? Oh, Chris? sure. So, yeah. So, um, yeah, I want to talk a little about, uh, a little bit about specifically his, um, there's this one article from Vanity Fair from 1997 called The Man Who Would Be Gates. Um, and it's a profile of, um, <laughs> of, uh, of Larry Ellison. And he has this like, and, like, it's really, it's funny because like the entire, most of the article is about, it, it's sort of like, 
they're like a, sort of allowing him to like ramble on about his um his um how he wants to like take down Microsoft and he wants to take over um Apple and um even though he like considers himself like a like a really he, or considered himself rather I suppose a really close friend of Steve Jobs but this would have been like mm. the period like when Steve Jobs was um I guess I don't know if he'd come back yet to Apple but he was maybe just about to come back in 1997 and um uh larry ellison was like sort of like engineering this plot at the time to try to take control of apple (laughs) like from his for who he called a personal friend steve jobs jesus but so he likes steve jobs but he has this really irrational hatred of bill gates like not that hating bill gates is irrational or anything like that but like his his hatred of bill gates is like purely based in ego it's like a jealousy um it's like a jealousy thing imagine being jealous of bill gates (laughs) yeah yeah well no it's it's like his, his his hatred of Bill J, uh, his jealousy of Bill Gates even comes from this point of like arrogance, like that nerd, I'm so much cooler than he is, right? Like that sort of kind of attitude, sure. that's right. sort of the attitude he has about him. But like this is the 1990s, you know, Bill Gates is the, um, you know, like the computer software king, um, you know. Bill Gates mm. didn't have a chin strap, so I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, he's number one, and, like, Ellison is number two, so, um, you know, as far as, like, you know, large software companies, so he considers Gates to be his number one competitor, um, even though they're not really, they don't really compete with each other, because, um, you know, Bill Gates was more in the realm of, um, you know, personal computers, and, um, you know, Ellison was more, um, you know, they're more in the the database sector, right? They're dealing with, um, you know, commercial, commercial commercial vendor, they're dealing with large corporations and stuff like that, so um, they're not in personal computers but he wants to move into personal computers in the 90s because he wants to um um he wants to compete with bill gates but like what he really hates the most is that like um people know who bill gates is like gates was like very Mm. obviously very well known in the 90s as the head of microsoft um but at this time nobody really knew um not a whole lot of people really knew who Larry Ellison was. He wasn't very particularly like well known at this time as the public face of Oracle, even though people may have heard of Oracle. Um, and that's largely because, like I said, you know, Oracle was um, you know a vendor for for large corporations, whereas Microsoft is um, you know basically a consumer business um, selling personal computers to individual consumers. So Ellison decides he's going to try to get in on the PC market by developing um, what would become known as a network computer or an NC, which is like, a, um, I guess his idea of like a stripped down version of a PC that stores its files on a network instead of, uh, instead of on the hard drive. The idea being like less hardware that needs to go into the machine makes for like a less expensive product, you know, at a time when the home computer ownership was picking up steam. So he's basically trying to, um, you know, he comes up with this scheme to undercut you know, undercut Bill Gates and Microsoft, and he gets IBM and Netscape and like some other companies who were also sort of like feeling the squeeze of Microsoft's office uh, or market dominance um, to like get on board and and partner with them. And um, there's a couple little just sort of funny anecdotes I thought from this um, from this story. There's one where they're talking about this like. Um, Big conference he had um, in November of 1996 for Oracle's top like 700 managers or top most performing managers or whatever, and like they had like a, I guess like a presentation, like a slide presentation. Who was it? PowerPoint? Who knows? Maybe not. Probably not. I don't know. Could have been. Uh, but they're giving like a this slide presentation, um, and like one of them is like a computer generated image. Uh, it says of Bill Gates, um, like giving the crowd the finger, <laughs> like. The he used to like think, I guess they created to like inspire hatred right and then the next slide is like a um like a like a like a depression like a picture of a, like a depression era um sharecropper or something and they're like this is um <laughs> this is what Bill Gates is going to do to you right like this is what he wants you to be you know this is what if they they're, they're going to take the market from us <gasps> and then it goes on to say here he got his uh yeah Ellison's number 2 Ray Lane got on stage like backed by a group of gospel singers, like in Blues Brothers, um, oh my get God. up to kind of like sing this <laughs> no. gospel song about you know how the the network computer was better than <laughs> like better than uh, Microsoft's PC. Um, yeah, I love that. I, I know that there's like a long storied <laughs> tradition of like Silicon Valley executives doing some of like the most historically cringy things humankind has ever produced on stage but like can they stop fucking no, shocking dude, they love it have you ever seen the video of the windows 95 launch where they're all like dancing dude 
What did they come out to? I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, of course I've seen that. What what song was that? I can't remember. It was not celebrate good times. What was it? No, I fucking think it might have been. Oh fucking yeah, Rolling Stones. of course. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I never yeah. Stop. I'm playing yeah. it right now. It's so cool. He's like yeah, pumping his fist. Jesus Christ! <laughs> just ill-fitting golf shirts and dockers. And just, I mean, uh, fucking... Um, They're so confident about it, too. Yeah, Steve That's Ballmer, what always, like, gets me about it. I mean, he's just, like, sweating through his undershirt and shit. They're so happy because they're so rich. <laughs> I, yes! That's what Yes! <laughs> Fuck, I'm opening a third beer. But anyway, so in, in, this, in this same article, there's, um, he's, like, he's also talking about how, um, like, how he, because like, I guess his sort of competitiveness with um with with Steve Jobs and how he wants to um to take control of Apple and he like tells the um I guess the interviewer his like his plot and um reading a little bit directly from the uh from the article here this is Ellison Ellison speaking he says um to the you know to the journalist he says this isn't coming out for another month right well this is going to shock a lot of people but I'm not going to buy a single share of Apple Instead, Ellison says, he plans to take advantage of a clause in California corporate law that allows anyone controlling 10% of a company's stock. He suggests he has friends who are accumulating that stock as he speaks to call a special shareholders meeting to vote on a new slate of board members. Ellison says he's going to start a proxy fight. But why? Everyone in Silicon Valley knows Ellison has been looking at Apple for at least two years, initially because he thought Apple's elegant operating system might work well on a network computer. When network computer prototypes ended up using a different software, most analysts assumed Ellison's interest in Apple had cooled. The betting, in fact, was that he really wanted to buy Netscape. It says the little internet, the little internet dynamo whose rise ignited the so-called browser wars with Microsoft. Ellison says he wants to buy and revitalize Apple to carry out his new mission, putting a computer on the desk of every American child. <laughs> Computers in the box, he calls it. <laughs> and it's funny because there's like a, a different article I read. Um, I, I read that has like an interview with him, and he's like, like that's explicitly one of his criticisms about like of Steve Jobs and about like other, um, I guess people like you know his competition in this sector is that they like bullshit and say that they're like doing it for the future of like America's children or whatever. Like he like that's specifically a criticism he has of other people. And then he tries to claim mm. that this like you know bitterness and jealousy or whatever he has against um you know people who may be w more companies that may be more well known to his or you know other people who may be more well known than him um is that he's really doing it for um you know he's going to take control of apple so he can put um you know a computer on the desk of every Ameri american child which is a really noble um you know noble calling it's funny that that article actually ends and again this is from 1997 but it, it ends with this like paragraph that um <laughs> Obviously, this didn't happen, but they're like foreshadowing, or they're like sort of like giving this like foreshadowing that um, you know that Ellison's accomplice is like secretly at work on taking control of of Apple through you know taking control of uh, of ten percent of the company's stock. So it says right here, as of late April, Ellison still wasn't chairman of Apple Computer, nor had he announced the proxy fight he promised. However. A mysterious and unlikely investor, Prince Al-Walid bin Talal of Saudi Arabia, who, oh boy. <laughs> who I, lo I looked, I looked <laughs> up, by the way, I, I looked him up. He's actually one of the ones that, remember in, I guess it was 2017, when Mohammed uh, bin Salman did like that purge of like, you know, other members of the royal family yes. who may have been yes. sort of competition, yeah. and, like locked them up under like, like anti-corruption charges or whatever. Um, in the Ritz Carlton, he was one of those ones that <laughs> he was one no. of those ones at that time. That, um, that, oh my um, god! Bin Salman, I guess, purged from his um, position. But it says, Damn. yeah, this uh, uh, Prince Al Walid <laughs> bin Talal so of Saudi Arabia declared that he had purchased five percent of Apple stock. Al Walid is one of the world's wealthiest men, an investor in Euro Disney, London's Cannery Wharf Development, Citicorp. Uh, in December, during a visit to the U.S. to research potential technology investments, he met with Ellison at Ellison's San Francisco home. In March, Ellison called Al Walid in Saudi Arabia to suggest they join forces in a run at Apple. Silicon Valley is now watching closely to see whether Al, Al Walid will put his money where Ellison's mouth is. Yeah, what happened? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's lucky he wasn't killed, I suppose. Um, he just got locked in the Ritz-Carlton for, yeah. uh, for a year or so. <laughs> 
but um, but so like basically that's world. kind of a little bit of a side note. The main thing here was the um, his his um, Bill Bill Gates is his main target. Bill Gates is the one that he really personally dislikes and like really um, you know sees him as a direct competitor. Again, when like this is at a time when Bill Gates is like the wealthiest person in the country, and like um, Ellison was like the second wealthiest, or, or like one of like one of the top wealthiest in the nineties. Is his his position has slipped a little bit since then, but um, as far as like the rank of like you know wealthiest in the country he was a little bit higher in the um in, in the 90s and he's obviously not competing directly with um with bill gates but all, all of this sort of comes to a head during microsoft's antitrust case um like in the um in the late 90s and early 2000s um a bit of a throwback to last week's episode ellison hires a corporate intelligence firm not Kroll, um, but Kroll's number one <laughs> competitor, IGI, the Investigative Group International. He hires them. Um, and I'll be honest, this is a little bit cool. I mean, this is kind of cool. Obviously, there's no like good and bad side <laughs> to this. Like everybody involved in this is bad, but yeah. I, I'm definitely in favor of um, like PIs being hired to rat fuck Microsoft. Like that's always gonna be <laughs> that's always gonna be cool to me. <laughs> it's just so, cool, yeah. Uh, but they like what they're hired to investigate is these like supposedly independent groups that are um, um, at this time like being vocal supporters of Microsoft and they're, they're doing. Stuff like taking out full page ads in the newspaper, like defending Microsoft against this, like, you know, these allegations of being a monopoly and all this sort of antitrust stuff. And um, and they all it's funny, they all have names like um the Institute for Free Market Economics and Technology and stuff like that. And they're all Love they're it. They're all it's funny, they're all pretending to be independent groups of like economists and academics and mm. shit like that. But what what it actually turns out is that they're like all funded actually by Microsoft. Like they're all like sort of uh, it's like a PR thing by Microsoft. Um, so Ellison hires this um, hires IGI, this detective firm, to investigate this shit that Microsoft is like attempting to do to sway public opinion um, in order to you know embarrass them <laughs> in the middle of this um, like antitrust case. Um, and like reading a little bit, this is from a, a New York Times article from 2000. Where did it go? It's called. Um I guess it's just called Oracle hired a detective agency to investigate Microsoft's allies. And reading a little bit from that, it says um, Oracle said it had retained the detective firm in June 1999 to investigate the Independent Institute of Oakland, California, a free market policy institute that had just placed full paid advertisements uh, defending Microsoft signed by 240 academic figures and portrayed as reflecting independent views in The Washington Post and The New York Times. In September, the Times, citing in internal institute documents, reported that the independent institute's ad was actually paid for by Microsoft. The Times said that the, that the documents had been provided by a Microsoft uh, adversary associated with the computer industry who refused to be further identified. Uh, a Times spokeswoman, Catherine Mathis, said it had long been the paper's policy not to disclose names of confidential sources. Um, here's another one of the, the names of these like supposedly independent groups that was being funded by Microsoft. This one's called the National Taxpayers Union, um, says which wow. had issued a study blaming the antitrust case for a loss of value in state pension funds. Had received uh, they had received financing from Microsoft. Um, it attributed the information mm. to a person familiar with the group's corporate fundraising. Here's another one. They all it's so funny to me. They all have like the same sort of names. Here's another one. This one is called the Association for Competitive Technology, um, which was uh, it's like vague <laughs> enough. That's legit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, vague enough, but like uh, uh, like uh, um, innocuous enough, but like just you know, there's some shit yeah. behind it. Sounds like computer yeah, generated. Oh, absolutely. Like. And like they were like um, basically these these private investigators were like digging through the trash and like trying to um, you know steal um, like documents and stuff from um, from these. That's like eighty percent of, of being course. a private yeah, investigator. Absolutely. But it says here actually it says that they um, they offered two cleaning workers, two people who um, worked at the offices. Um, they like offered them cash to um, like provide them with the trash from the company like when they were instead of taking it out they like tried to bribe them into like pay them for the cash uh or excuse me to pay mm. them for the trash rather and oh yeah going back to reading from the article here oh yeah here's another one called another one of these groups called citizens for a sound economy <laughs> i love it mm. it sounds really it. real for sure. it sounds yeah. totally real um yeah i'm in that one um 
<laughs> but it says so both that group and the Independent Institute reported recent thefts of laptop computers from their offices that they said might have contained documents that later appeared in the press. The targets of the Oracle Mac investigation expressed outrage this evening, suggesting that the company was guilty of the same dirty pool tactics of which it has long accused Microsoft. It's despicable, said Jonathan Zuck, president of the Association for Competitive Technology. I would hope to get a letter of apology from Larry Ellison and an explanation of how, in a climate of so much concern over the issue of privacy, he could think this is an acceptable business practice. He said he was considering legal action over what he said was a violation of his employees' privacy, employees privacy in the trash buying attempt. This is not a dumpster diving in offices outside of the building. This is bribery, he said. It's also a security issue. Uh, uh, repeated requests by phone and email for comment from Mr. Allison were unavailing. Um, David J. Thoreau, president of the Independent Institute, said Oracle had called into question its own credibility. Quote, clearly anybody who stoops to whatever was done here you can't trust, he says. He asserted that the documents that were cited in the Times obscured the debate because they implied that the Independent Institute was a front for Microsoft. I think it's pretty clear that, that it was, that that's actually the case. <laughs> uh, Mr. Mr. Yeah. Thoreau said the Institute was advocating free market policies for years before Microsoft ever became a supporter. It says here, it's unfortunate that instead of uh, engaging in uh, engaging the issues in a visible public forum, Mr. Thoreau said, speaking of Oracle, it was considered to be appropriate to use subterfuge and back alley tactics to deal with the issues. John Berthoud, president of the National Taxpayers Union, said, it's disappointing but perhaps not unexpected that Microsoft opponents who are trying to use the American judicial system to run down Microsoft would stoop to these kind of political tactics against the voices of the free market. Mr. Berthoud said he had been approached by reporters contending that uh, they had been given internal financial documents from his group, but he said... He had not seen the documents and could not verify their authenticity. He said this group engages in a rough and tumble kind of politics. This kind of nonsense is uncalled for and below the belt. So, I mean, you know, obviously no no good players on any side of this. It is, I, I do enjoy seeing, um, you know, all these, these people... <laughs> Like doing doing um, sort of uh, uh, Microsoft's um, reputation laundering during this period, kind of like getting put on blast. It's pretty satisfying to me, honestly, to see that. Um, Absolutely, it's just like it's like a a, a, a proxy war <laughs> of like financial right, interests. Right, right, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. anything that damages any one of them in, in, in any sort of way, I'm all for. But obviously, Larry Ellison isn't actually cool. <laughs> um, although there's this no. website. No, he sucks. No. Despite the chin strap. Despite the chin strap. Chin strap has never been cool. Well, we'll, we'll talk hey, about Hey, li- listen, man. You know, where, 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 where were we in 2004, all right? In, uh, and we were, lis- we were listening to Godsmack and uh, Disturbed. And there was, uh, there was a, probably a large constituency. I mean, I obviously never had one. But uh, the large constituency of people that would have had one driving a uh, 97 <laughs> Honda Civic. You know, if you look at Wayne Static, you can't tell me he doesn't look good with the little thin, and then he's got like the long. Fuck, it's true. There is, um, you know? there is peace, by the way, static. I did find this article from um, complex.com, and the title of it is Larry Ellison's Most Badass Moments. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> mm, do I want to see mean, this? I yeah, mean, it's all stuff like, I mean, they, they do mention, um, you know, the thing about hi- hiring the private investigators to dig through Microsoft's trash to try to publicly publicly Girl embarrass Bill moment. Gates. Um, uh, oh, they, here's another one here. It says, uh, oh, this is, this is the one that really made me. Uh, I'll just read it. The resemblances are nearly uncanny between Ellison and Robert Downey Jr.'s version of Tony Stark. No. No. <laughs> no. no. Stop. no. Self-made, <laughs> ego, no. ego maniacal billionaires who've dominated the tech sector. They're particularly... They're practically doppelgangers minus the superhero suit. Uh, it says oh. Iron, Iron Man 2 producers came up with the dope idea of having the Oracle Kingpin make a special no. appearance in the sequel, uh, greeting Stark on a stairway and requesting the Avenger give him a call. Gets no cooler than a oh Marvel cameo. God. That's what it's just a little editorial there, which I'm sure Shane, um, if he was here, he would be agreeing with. Did Larry Ellison write this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, he's 
he's like, and he also yeah. fucks a lot. Well, it's ladies funny. Yeah, they, love do, they do mention like, you know, all the money he spends, <laughs> like his his surround sound, his like stereo system, his home like stereo system, whatever. He's also like he owns a bunch of you know petty that is. He owns a bunch you know of how yachts. Fucking petty that is. is. <laughs> to show off your fucking hi-fi? Yeah. Are you shitting? That's some, that's some fucking 70s shit. Like, ladies, that's, uh, come in. You gotta see, you know, everybody thinks about the subwoofer, but have you heard the tweeters? It's, lit- well, it's literally like serial killer shit, like from American Psycho. It's literally like a bit. In yeah, the, it in is. Movie. Um, he's also like, he's, he's yeah. obsessed. He, he's got this weird, um, I'm sure, I'm sure very respectful, like obsession with, um, with like Japanese culture. Um, and it's funny, what? like that one mm. Vanity Fair article where like every time they quote, like they're, they're like meeting with him in his, um, in his house in, uh, at the time it was Atherton, California, um, which actually I'm familiar with. It is in San Mateo County and it's like literally the only, it's one of the richest, like zip codes in in not just San Mateo County but also the country and it's also like the only Republican stronghold of San Mateo County. <laughs> yeah, oh, well, uh, well, I thought yeah, I thought he well, lived he in did. Woodside. Yeah, he, he, it was he, right yeah next exactly. To it, right. He lived in um, he lived in uh, 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 Atherton originally, and then he built like a hundred million dollar home in Woodside that was based on like a. Um, like a 16th century Japanese village or, or something like that. And, and it's funny, like in the Vanity Fair, um, you know, article, they're, they're like meeting with him there and they're interviewing him and they're like, they'll, he'll, they'll like be quoting him, like saying some shit about how he's like trying to destroy Bill Gates. And it'll be like, Ellison said with the the gurgling waterfalls like <laughs> sounding behind him Fuck or like you. something like that. Um, <laughs> oh my god, this is crazy looking. I'm looking oh, at pictures please send right it, now. Please send it. Please send it. It's like a. I want to see. Like a, I want to see what this guy yeah. thinks. Is but, yeah, what he, he should had, be doing. He had one thirty million dollar Japanese style home in Atherton, which he sold and moved out of when he built his hundred million dollar version of that in um, neighboring Woodside. He also has a twenty-five wow. million dollar mansion in San Francisco. Uh, he has had at least three yachts. Um, I'm sure there's others, but the names of the ones I had here were um, the uh, the Ronin, the Katana, and the Rising Sun. <gasps> no, 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 no. Oh my no. God! Look at him posing. Look at him posing in his outfit please, in the middle of his too. pond. Oh, this is this is really fantastic. Uh, oh! <laughs> <laughs> No! Oh yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a really great oh, picture, yeah. dude. Damn. <laughs> that's a really what happens? Good picture. What happens here? Like, what happens uh, with these guys? By the way, when I said it looks crazy, I meant like this is a really beautiful house. Yeah, it is sure. just like really funny that he's like you know dressing up and like I don't know. He's like a weeaboo. He's like a billionaire weeaboo. Yeah, it's a weird. It's like a cosplaying type thing, I, I guess. I don't know. It's weird. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, and I'm I'm looking at the yacht, like the the Ronin. Mm-hmm. I mean, it looks like a fucking warship from you know if if like a, a danish architect uh designed it it's really <laughs> i mean it's really something and i because i know he he's he like funds like sailing and shit like that i don't know if you're gonna yeah talk about i, I <laughs> yeah i i'm not i'm not much i read a little bit about that and it's it's funny it's again like another one of the example of these examples of like a, like a phenomenon that we've you know mentioned on this show before of just like rich fucking assholes with a personal grudge against each other just like suing each other back and forth and that's kind of like something that he got into over um like apparently there's like (laughs) there's like very um sort of like old um like there's this old legal document called the deed of gift which is a 1200 word legal document from 1887 to like um sort of um you know lays the ground rules for like yacht sailing competition or whatever like that and then no he's way. like in some fucking like pissing contest with some other rich asshole you know over like kind of like suing each other back and forth um because i guess there's some sort of rules like if you win the america's cup or whatever you get to keep it until um a um a yacht club from another country that has to meet certain rules including holding an annual regatta until they challenge you, and then after that challenge is issued and accepted, ten months later, it's ridiculous. All of this fucking pomp, who's, who's pomp, and pageantry, time, and all this shit that goes along goes along with it. But like, then ten months later, you know, you'll have your your race, and then you'll have another competition for the America's Cup or whatever like that. It's like it's it's like sort of like a it's like nineteenth century dueling type stuff. Like that's sort of the um the same kind of lines that it's along. And they've basically been um it's it's uh it was uh, Ellison and. 
and some other guy named uh, Bertatelli, uh, Ernesto Bertatelli, who's another uh, billionaire. And they like spent several years just sort of suing each other back and forth over various ridiculous yacht related. <laughs> <laughs> yacht yacht racing related things i mean I've, I've just for fun i've seen some of those uh you know the the crazy regattas that they've had where he has his you know oracle team or whatever which he's like sponsored a lot of this stuff where they're like racing these carbon fiber hydrofoils that are doing like fucking 40 right. knots or something like that it's it's, it's right. wild like it's r- objectively super cool to see like you know the 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 ragged edge of um you know uh, uh sailing sure. that, that we can push these uh, boats to but i mean you know it just sucks that it can't <laughs> fucking exist without like this psycho right exactly and that's the you know kind of saying? thing they were suing each other back and forth over it's like there's a very specific um i, I guess you know, rules or, or whatever, like different measurements that the yacht, I guess, has to, you know, in order to be eligible for competition, or whatever, like there's very specific sort of weight things and, and length, you know, um, requirements and things like that, ag- according to this um, deed of gift, um, as it's called. Actually, uh, another one of Allison's yachts is called Dogzilla, dog being an abbreviation for <laughs> deed of gift. No. Yeah. Um, which she named because I guess it uh, uh, perfectly, um, you know, lives up to the um, requirements of the deed of gift. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. Oh, absurd that's really good. Shit. Yep. That's really good. I, I don't know if, did you have anything about Paul Allen and the, like them going back and forth about the, having the biggest uh, yacht? I read a little bit about that. I know you pointed that out to me. You also pointed out that G- Ghislaine Maxwell, another <laughs> famous um, person who's yeah. been, been oh, aboard. Isn't um, that interesting? Had <laughs> hung out Allen's on Paul yacht, Allen's yeah. yacht, right? Yeah. He, yeah. But it's so funny because they kept going like back and forth to see who had like the biggest super yacht or whatever. I think it was yeah. in the 90s and, and again, or this early is his 2000s. weird, like, um, his, his like anti-Microsoft thing um, that again is like so obviously right. based on envy and jealousy when he himself is like a, already a billionaire. <laughs> he should have just like gone after man. them for being yeah. pedophiles. Well, yeah. Who knows what he's hiding? <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I wonder why exactly. he didn't. Great Allegedly. Question. Probably. You know, just asking questions. Man, um, it's just, they're <laughs> so fucking petty, dude. The ch- fucking children. Oh, and this, this, just this. Uh, by the way, one, one more thing. There's just, there's so many good little. Like in reading about the yacht stuff, there's just like I was just like had the page open here, and I just had to read this, this little paragraph here. Just another, um, another one of our old friends making an appearance. Quote: Everybody's talked about making the America's Cup fairer, says industrialist William Bill Coke who won the cup in 1992. Yes. <laughs> uh. <laughs> but, but what is it they say about absolute power corrupting absolutely? I, I don't know, Bill Koch. What do they say about that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do, you tell us. <laughs> they, they, they literally think that, the, you know, that their class are the only people in the world that matter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, just looked, I just looked up Bill Koch and he's got, he has a book called Bill Coke on cross country skiing. Oh, for sure. Imagine. Ugh. Let me let me look at a picture of him just to stoke my hatred. Yeah, there no, he is. He's, uh, he's just look at bloated, him. fucking, you know, hideous monster of a man. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um. <laughs> so I had a little bit about his uh, politics. Oh, I, and I'm, I'm sorry. If you want me I'm to so get sorry. Into One last bit. thing. Why? I I I had to look no, it up. Please. Wyatt Coke is Bill Coke's um son. Remember Wyatt? Remember Wyatt it, Coke? Uh, okay. Do I remember Wyatt Coke? He, Wait, is Wyatt is Wyatt the one Coke the, shirts, the one with yeah. the shirts? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. The one with the shirts and the you know the, that you can wear at a disco. Uh, disco orange tacho. face. Yeah. That's what he says. <laughs> is that what he yeah. Said? I want something you can there's, wear there's in the hun- boardroom or at the discotheque. Yeah. There's a hundred percent chance that uh, uh, Wyatt Coke has started a sentence with "When I was in Ibiza." <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I, I'm just I gonna hate you, White Coke. <laughs> Would you go go? In like every fucking picture too, he's got this like smile with his like head cocked to the side. It's like a PR person told him that like, look, man, you're not working with many great angles. <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's at least just like try to polish his turd here. I didn't. I didn't realize that Sam Cedar wore the. Uh, oh, that's so the funny. Wyatt Coke money shirt. That's so funny. The, the same shirt. That's really good. <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> Um. Yeah, money shirt. It's money it's, you shirt. You know what? It's a nice. It's a nice shirt. I think he wears it well. I think on that to um, pour my fourth beer. 
you know fuck yeah you know how hard we had to work like in school just to like i just i just can't believe like imagine just being born and then like by the time you're like you know the thing i didn't work hard in school so well I don't know. yeah i just got i mean <laughs> i did i just got bad grades um and you know by the time you're like eight you like you know you act different around kids because you don't have to do this or that or whatever and then like by the right. time like you're probably like 13 you kind of understand like listen i know that when i turn 18 i'm gonna inherit like 300 million dollars like right. how the like what the fuck it's got to, it, uh, uh, there's, there's no way that you don't like develop psychopathic tendencies. Like these people aren't, are like, are inhuman in some ways. I mean, it's like the thing that I was telling you guys that I can't really like say details about, but the thing I was telling you I was working on the other day where I ended up listening to somebody who is like in a pretty like secure position in life talking about their process of finding another job after being involved in like a very public scandal right and she was just so calm about it and i was thinking about like how stressed out i am about like finding my next freelance job or like how am i gonna pay for whatever and she's just like yeah so my name's been all over the news but you know i I know that that doesn't matter i know that we're gonna like make it work or whatever i was just like i'm gonna kill myself (laughs) like this sucks it's it's so wild like seeing it like laid bare because they never like outwardly say that right they're always like you know i worked really hard to get here but she was just like i know i'm gonna be fine and the person she was talking to was like yeah of course like don't even worry about it we're all in a secret club where we're gonna do, help each do you, other do you, have, do you know how many times like i'm sure this has happened to, to you guys and like maybe, maybe people that are listening like where you like go to clock in or log in or something like that and like your login or your clock in like doesn't take or like your password is wrong and, and you think and you're fired yes, yes and the <laughs> yes. first thought is just like they they're, course, i'm out i'm out i'm dead man that's it, i'm that's fucked it. up man you'd be fucked up bro <laughs> yeah like i don't have a job anymore i don't have health insurance anymore yep. whatever like i'm fucked yeah of like course that's, that's the, every the fucking, single time <laughs> the ragged edge of us just being like just like you know at, at any you know a one missed paycheck puts us down a fucking a rung on maslov's hierarchy and it's like we're, <laughs> yeah. we're that's it i'm fucking cooked that was it. I lost the game. It's just like a frame of mind that's like totally foreign to these people, right? Like they can't even imagine. And that, does, like you were saying, that does have to kind of make you kind of like a psychopath, I would guess, to never have to worry about anything, to know that you're just like always fine no matter what and you can just do anything. Meanwhile, and there's no consequence. And, and, and like Larry Ellison gets fined like a hundred million dollars and he was like, Right. This reminds me of one of my favorite 14th century <laughs> no plays from Japan. <laughs> God. <laughs> let's let's get that beer going. Oh, yeah. Do it. Get it going. There it is. Pop it. There oh, it is. All right. All right. There it is. We should get you a keg. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. For next episode. That's, Just have like a big keg that's what, going. That's what we need to give Dwight some more booze. <laughs> It's weird recording sober. I haven't done it in a very long time. Yeah, again, I, I it's been you know upwards of a year that I've had uh, a few drinks while we're while we're uh, recording. But um, you know, maybe you'll make some death threats by the end of it. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. We're gonna get you there. I was close. We're gonna get you there. <laughs> All right. God damn it. All right. <laughs> Tell me about this motherfucker's political contributions. And so I wanted to talk just a little bit about his politics, and then a little bit about his quote unquote philanthropic work. Um, as far as politics go, it's like pretty unsurprising. He's like not ex- he hasn't been explicitly conservative in the past. He's donated to both parties, kind of like normal billionaire behavior in terms of like donating to whatever candidates are the most likely to give him what he wants. That type of stuff. He was a really big Trump supporter. Um, he hosted, I think, a couple of fundraising mm-hmm. events. He um mm-hmm. donated to Trump's reelection campaign. Um, and then, but after Trump lost the election, he um, stopped donating to Trump's PAC. Um, and like a lot of rich Republican donors, he's kind of turned his sights to congressional races. I read a couple of articles about um, how a lot of billionaires have started doing this. They want to like take Congress back. Um, he's donated a lot to Marco Rubio in Florida and Tim Scott in South Carolina. Jesus. Just a couple months ago, he gave $5 million to Scott's PAC. And you might recognize Tim Scott's name. He's the only black Republican in the Senate, I believe. Um, earlier this year, he was the one that um, did the response to Biden's address and said America is not a racist country. Right. Oh, so- my God. <laughs> so that's who he's donating to. Um 
that's just a little little primer there. In terms of his philanthropic activity, he's had a pretty strong focus on sort of medicine and biotech, but there is a little bit of variety. He's helped to raise and donated tens of millions of dollars to the IDF okay. over the years. Right. How, yep. Like how First what, stuff, what the what the fuck? Like can I well, can I donate money to the military, to the US military? You you could uh, give money to create well-being facilities for the soldiers, if you would like, no which is what way. Ellison did for the IDF, or like fortifying community centers, things like that. And I was reading a little bit about him and like his ties to um, like various parts of the industry. And I believe he owns like a really big share of an Israeli company called Quark. And it was talking about his ties to that company. Um, and he is Jewish, so... There is that connection there, and he, um, but he's been really explicit about like not being religious. And in the book, he specifically says that like the reason he gives a lot of money to the IDF and is like connected to Israel is because of their quote steely pragmatism, respect for intellect, and ingrained entrepreneurialism, which is like Yeesh. yeah, it's a little weird. Um, in addition to that, like I said, really strong focus on medical research over the last few decades. He even had aspirations about forming his own research-focused university. Um, I don't believe that ever panned out. Like, a lot of his endeavors um, on the philanthropy side don't really pan out. He's really good at making money. He's not really that great at, like, donating it to good he causes. Took, he took the billionaire's um, pledge, though. He's giving it all away. Yeah. He sure did. Sure. He sure did. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> but um, here's a little bit from that book that I read, which was called Soft War. Very clever title. Uh. Uh, <laughs> about that research university he wanted to form. Um, Ellison says, within a traditional university, there's a lot of ambiguity about the ownership of intellectual property. Who owns the patent? The researcher or the university? Who gets the royalties? So I'm thinking of starting a research university that enables scientists to pursue pursue their ideas, patent them, and even create companies on the outside to commercialize their ideas if that's what they want to do. I want to break down the remaining walls between university research department and commercial biotechnology companies. Hopefully that will allow new drugs to come to market more quickly. Lives will be saved and fortunes will be made. Patients will get healthy and professors will get rich. A perfect marriage of humanitarian ideals and market incentives. Human nature at its very best. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So he looked at he looked at research universities and he was like, mm -hmm. you know what the problem is here? Uh, they're not privatizing breakthroughs fast yes. enough. Yes. I think also part of his problem with like academia and just the whole research process is that by giving money, he didn't get to control it was something that was kind of like expressed in the book. Like he's very wary of academia because of that, because he wants to just be able to like give somebody millions of dollars and be like, now make me live forever. That's really right. like right. his goal in the end. Um, I mean, all of that sounds pretty bad to me. I don't think we need to commercialize pharmaceutical research, especially more. I'm not an expert <laughs> or anything, but <laughs> I don't know if we want to turn the free market dial all the way on that one. Um, he does have, or I should say he did have, a medical foundation in his name as well, the Ellison Medical Foundation. And I think the name change at some point, I think Ellison Medical was the latest name. It was the Larry Edison Foundation at one point. Um, he founded that in 1997. And I'll get into why that's in the past tense in a second. But here's a little snippet from the foundation's website kind of saying what they're about. Um, the EMF was primarily concerned with the issue of aging, its personal costs, and the financial and social impacts of an increasingly elderly population. The EMF supported multidisciplinary approaches and new and creative scientific research. Its emphasis was on projects that were too risky for other funding sources, supporting both new and established researchers pursuing new approaches. It was novel in its light-touch approach to grant applications and processes. Sorry, I had to burp. I should have poured my Coke into a glass. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, so in that, again, you can see kind of his disdain for traditional approaches, not just to research, but even to philanthropy. Interestingly, it's kind of unclear that the foundation actually produced anything of value during the decades that it existed. It definitely gave money to some other organizations that did stuff, not the bulk of their money. It does seem like they just kind of sunk their money into research projects that didn't go anywhere. and. About a year ago, they abruptly announced that the foundation would be closed and the team would be disbanded. 
Um, they hadn't actually been granting new funding, I think, since 2013, but had committed to continue funding all projects that had been in progress during that time. That They had kind of, like, paused. It's really weird. He kind of, like, paused and restarted the foundation multiple times. And then, like, around, I think it was August or September 2019, he had just relaunched it. And then the month before he abruptly ended it in 2020, it was September 2020, I think, that it was announced in August 2020 that he sent the email. He had made this post that Recode reported on kind of asking for a second shot at philanthropy and acknowledging that he hadn't really accomplished much. And here's a quote from the Recode article. The founder of Oracle says he wants to be judged on his results at the Larry Ellison Foundation, but he must also reckon with the fact that for all of his success in the world of making money, he has not succeeded in the world of giving it away. He has vast and positive publicity for promises to donate millions and then retracted offers with little explanation, sunk hundreds of millions into moonshot projects like life extension research before suddenly pulling funding, and made public promises about charitable giving that he appears nowhere close to fulfilling. Nothing has quite worked out. So he had at the time of that relaunch um, in 2019, he tried to say that they would refocus on more traditional projects instead of like this type of life extension stuff and like whatever cryogenic freezing type of shit to like make him live forever like we were talking about earlier. More traditional stuff like cancer research, you know, like curing actual existing diseases. And then just very abruptly in September 2020, they stopped all operations. You might wonder why. Well, supposedly this move for Ellison was about refocusing his medical philanthropic efforts on combating the novel coronavirus, COVID-19. Oh, my God. (laughs) It was reported in the same Recode article that I mentioned a second ago. A lot of people had been kind of questioning why his foundation that was so focused on medical philanthropy wasn't really doing anything with its billions of dollars about COVID. Like, that seemed like somewhere where they could have a tangible impact. There was obviously a lot of stuff going on that required resources that were just not around. Um, And Ellison's answer, I guess, was to simply shut that shit down and say, it's time to get serious about COVID and really turn all my attention toward that. And like I said, it was really abrupt that he shut it down. Um, He sent them an email, like, really unceremoniously. It was based out of the UK. He sent them an email basically saying, like, stop working and it left some of the organizations that they worked with wondering how they would have funding after their grants would run out just because it was so sudden unclear what was going to happen with that i couldn't find anything about what happened to those organizations that were relying on that funding so but you know it's been a year now because that was in august september 2020 we're now in september 2021 so what is he um what has he done for the pandemic since then right he solved it. We're out of it. <laughs> that was it. And again, it's not even like it's not even like he needed that money for something else. No, no. Yeah, that's what's really weird. It's really unclear what he's been doing. But to be fair, there have been a couple of things that um, he's done about COVID that maybe you've heard of. Um, before this happened, early on in the pandemic, through Oracle, he donated um, this like software and database system to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services to test the efficacy of various therapeutics against the infection. Um, And it's really not clear from the articles I read that it's been useful at all. In fact, uh, a lot of epidemiologists have expressed concerns that it amounts to junk science so that if it is in use, it's kind of a problem (laughs) because it doesn't use like randomized control experiments to measure to measure drug efficacy. So it's just kind of I don't know who made it exactly, but it doesn't seem very scientific at all. It's just like a database that he was like, please use this to test these drugs. But maybe after that, there was something else he had done. I tried to look. Um, As far as I could tell, the only thing I could find in the last year is how horribly affected the Hawaiian island that he owns was at various Mm. times. I guess it went pretty well at first, but then it like struck them a little later than everybody else. Obviously, it's a little more insulated being an island, but it wasn't great. So once again, looking back, think back to the early days of the pandemic, back to a time before ivermectin, you might remember hydroxychloroquine. Hell yeah. Oh my God. If you recall. It seems so vintage now. And it seemingly, I, at least I felt it like kind of came out of nowhere, right? Um, people were suddenly talking about it on TV. Trump was talking about it. Everyone was talking about it. Apparently... Larry Ellison was one of the early proponents of it, and it, he was actually the one who convinced Trump oh, yeah. that it was effective. What? <laughs> According to the article I read, four separate people aware of the conversations said that it was through conversations with Larry Ellison that Trump came to believe that this was an effective treatment for COVID. So the whole intention of this database that Oracle had given to the government for free was to test hydroxychloroquine and the other experimental drugs. Um, and at the time, when Trump was still in office, they were even exploring if they could give bonus payments to doctors who would use the Oracle database to track the use and effectiveness of various therapeutics. Yeah, yeah. 
you know, in addition to the ethical concerns with that, the obvious ethical concerns, like I said, actual epidemiologists said that it was all kind of bullshit and not really designed to effectively do what it was purporting to do anyway. Um, And I'm assuming that it didn't work out just because, you know, we're not all using hydroxychloroquine to cure COVID. Well, maybe not you. Well, maybe not me, but, you know, maybe it could work for anybody listening to this. Try it. (laughs) Um, so, so those are really the two contributions that Ellison has made during the pandemic, you know, promoting hydroxychloroquine and creating a database that doesn't even really seem to be in use at all, which is probably for the best. So that's really analogous with the rest of his philanthropic work in that it's all kind of focused on stuff that sounds cool to him or might personally benefit him in some way without like consulting actual experts or being really grounded in any kind of medical reality. Apart from the few actually functional organizations he donates to, it's all just mostly burning money that could actually be put to good use in the hands of somebody competent, which I guess is always where we end up. When we talk about these people, it's great when they say they want to do something good with their money, but there's never really any accountability. It's all just left up to their whims. And at the end of the day, they really shouldn't have this money in the first place. Right. Right. (laughs) Right. It shouldn't be up to this guy how uh, COVID therapeutics are tracked or. Larry, thank you for hosting us. Thank you for hosting (laughs) us, Larry. You've said some very interesting things about. Hydroxy is something we're going to be looking into. We're going to be looking into lots of things. going to be looking into lots of cures for this terrible illness that's going on. You have a lot of good ideas. I hear you're investing heavily in a lot of industries, and uh, we're going to be looking into it. Thank you, Larry. <laughs> that's probably a direct quote. <laughs> exactly. Just put it in. Just say it's a direct quote. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I was, I was pretty sure. Sh- I mean, it's not, I guess it's not surprising, but it still is like a little bit shocking when you read that, right? Like this one guy, just because he happens to be good at, you know, making and stealing money, just had access to the president and like convinced him of that. We had to talk about that for so long, dude. <laughs> no. I'm so we've gotten so much older beyond our years. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. I I think um if I may I'd like to just kind of close this out with um is a little story about um I I, I I we we've used this term on the program before with uh, Elon Musk in Bolivia the term is neo conquistador and I think it's kind of apt to 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 uh, label Larry Ellison as he uh and I'm not being hyperbolic he bought a Hawaiian mm-hmm. island, mm-hmm. the sixth largest. He set up like resorts there, right? Well, it's, it's, that was his. Been worse than that, in fact. Um, oh no! He, he set up. He uh, bought the sixth largest Hawaiian island called uh, Lanai, and uh, basically he bought it from another extremely rich gentleman whose name is David Murdoch. And uh, who was the owner of Dole? Okay, which is, is this any this, relation to Googling Rupert? David there's Murdoch, a Rupert Murdoch, Jeffrey Epstein. No, I believe there's not. But we should we could do an entire episode on like Dole and and Hawaii because let's just say it was a uh, yeah not great. Well, we could do we could do an episode um, on so rich it, people owning uh, islands. Period. This never never ends up good. Yeah. <laughs> it's, so uh basically he he bought the entire island for in my opinion the paltry sum of 300 million dollars where he had bought literally wow yeah see, right right it doesn't that's that seem it? insane like that this guy it was like barely a dent in his uh in his that's like nothing to him i know that's nuts that's really nuts his net worth right now is 116.5 billion dollars that's like nothing it's, to him. it's yeah. nothing uh, that's not so basically he he bought uh this enormous you know he bought this island and he uh bought like 97 or 98 percent of it and he had promised i'm just going to kind of speed through this in in uh in interest of time but basically he kind of promised this idea that like he was going he had created this uh this alternative energy company called Pulama Lanai. And the idea was that mm. they were going to modernize the electrical system. You know, they there was a, a, a diesel generator plant, I believe, on the island that had been generating all the power for the island. And the idea was like, you know, he's going to revolutionize the place with farming and uh, sustainable agriculture. And then, of course, sustainable power generation with like solar and stuff like that. Uh, and so there was even a Business Insider article called, uh, this is from 2014, called Billionaire Larry Ellison has a brilliant plan to make green energy affordable with his Hawaiian island. And in my opinion, like, just the idea that it says his Hawaiian island is so fucked up to me. 
because i know like there, you know there's another um mark zuckerberg is like uh this other kind of neo conquistador on the island where he's con- consistently trying to privatize portions of it and make you know people that are you know indigenous mm-hmm. hawaiian islanders uh you know strangers in their own land which is fucking insane but you know they talk about this in this article it says it will become quote a laboratory for building the next generation two-way power grid, which will be a mix of photo tech, solar, with a little bit of wind, and a backup of, li- mm. of liquidified natural gas. And I'm following this up with a Business Journal article from 2020, where it says uh, Pulama Lanai, which is the, uh, the uh, you know, his company, ends talks about acquiring a Hawaiian electric Lanai utility. And basically it says here, Hawaiian electric and Pulum... Pulama Lanai have ended discussions about a potential sale of the electric system on Lanai, which will continue to be owned and operated by the utility. Land management company Pulama Lanai, which manages Larry Ellison's interests, approached and explored the sale of Hawaiian Electric's Lanai utility assets after Hawaiian Electric issued a request for proposals for renewable energy projects on the island. The deadline for responding to the RFP was postponed because of sale discussions. It says here, due to the recent global events and other factors, Pulama Lanai mm. has ended discussions with Hawaiian Electric to, pur- to purchase the Lanai utility. We remain committed to working closely with the Hawaiian Electric to pursue initiatives that move us closer to our vision of a self-sustaining island community. So basically, it's all, bl- it's all bluster, right? It's, it, was, right. it was completely fabricated from the beginning. It's not like a... Um, you know, a committed ideological project where it's like, hey, I believe so much in this that, you know, we're going to transform this. And they, they, even there was in that uh, Business Insider article, or excuse me, the New York Times article I was reading from earlier, where it was uh, it was titled, uh, Larry Ellison Bought an Island in Hawaii. Now what? There was this um, kind of filmmaker that had gone around the the island talking to people, asking like, hey, you know, What's this like? How, what has changed now that Larry Ellison has, has purchased the place? And it says here in the New York Times article, it says, uh, Mr., like, uh, a, a, um, you know, he's interviewing indigenous Hawaiians on the island saying, thank you for your work, Mr. Ellison. Thank you very much. I just want to take the time to thank Mr. Ellison for this unbelievable, incredible takeover of Lanai. And my heart is just like check this out on that vein. Look at this picture I just found. It's the cover of Lanai no today. Fucking way. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. to the listener, it says uh, a grateful community, and it's, it's like four people holding up a like a poster board with uh, written on it. Thank you, Mr. Ellison. Yeah. Very dark vibes coming off of that fucking just picture. not good vibes at all. It's it's really fucking bleak. And again, like, you know, somebody off screen is pointing a gun at them, like smile. (laughs) Allegedly. Allegedly. (laughs) No, Larry Ellison is off camera in this picture. (laughs) Pointing a gun at these workers. Um, Yeah, it's just it's oh God, I just have to say this one thing, which is really fucking weird, where it says uh, um, this this filmmaker seemed to understand the precariousness that power imbalance created the staggering responsibility, the incomprehensible control. At one point standing on the beach, he announces theatrically to the camera, the Bible says, where there is no vision, people perish. Eventually, he visits the island's animal rescue center, where a young employee explains that because there are no natural predators on Lanai, the feral cat population explodes. Right now, she tells him the the shelter is housing 380 cats. Mm. From behind the camera, the filmmaker hollers, so basically, these are 380 cats of Mr. Ellison's? (laughs) I'm just like... (laughs) <laughs> it's again uh, the fact and in, 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 in an effort to wrap this up here like the fact that this dude has like in no uncertain terms like laundered our taxpayer money by sure. way of providing database uh solutions to our federal government to continue the imperial project he has profited he has pocketed those profits uh in, in some cases keeping them fraudulently by like defrauding sure. investors and like uh you know breaking SEC's laws to uh you know to hold on to it and sell it ahead of or lack quote of, unquote uh, donating to his own charity exactly <laughs> and 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 also like and then just use that money to be like the pettiest little prick on earth <laughs> like with his biggest competitors who aren't even necessarily competitors and then like. <laughs> Also, just like do his weird political projects and then like end up being this like weird neo conquistador in Hawaii. It just it's just so fucking dark, man. 
And and I should mention too, like he is one of the CEOs that like did this trick, which always gets like written about in like, you know, kind of business, um, you know, bad business uh, media, which is like the fact that he takes a $1 salary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And like the implication mm-hmm. is that like, oh, you know, he's such a zealot for the uh, for his company that he takes a $1 salary. But what that means is that he's avoiding taxes. Yeah. <laughs> and he's taking money. You know, I was talking about this online uh, earlier today about like, it's just like crazy to me. Of course, you know, these guys make their money from their stock options and they're, you know, they, they, they hold these enormous stock holdings. And, um, you know, what's what's crazy to me is the fact that these people can take a whatever one dollar salary and just take out loans based on their, you know, their uh, their stock positions. Oh, can they do that? Yes. Yes. Oh, damn. Yes. So a good friend of the show, uh, Icebore, was going into some detail about it. And, you know, the fact that, like, they're unrealized capital gains, they don't have to they don't have to declare pay any taxes if they don't sell their shares. So they just take a loan out based off of their their, uh, you know, their holdings. Oh, I find that very upsetting. I didn't know about that. Well, I would tend to agree with you, Carrie. I feel like a dumb little baby for not knowing that. But yeah, that's uh. Wow. Not fun. <laughs> that's really, that's really like fucked. That's really upsetting. I just, what the uh, fuck? Yeah, no, it's, it's pretty, pretty goddamn bad. I mean, again, you know, that's this like is, so upsetting. It's pervasive, of course. Of course. Again, you know, because it's I like, didn't realize they, they could just hold that. their wealth in the stock market and then it just continues right. to increase, you know, especially like in the case of, um, during COVID with the massive stimulus plan, like, you know, that that raises yeah. the stock prices and saves it from its free fall and plummet in the beginning of COVID and shit. And then they can just take out a small $300 million loan and buy an island. I mean, it's it's nothing, really. It's really it's nothing. the work of but a moment. Just a, <laughs> just a you know, retainer. You said that so nice. Just, you made it sound so nice. <laughs> just a retainer of a few uh, white hat corporate lawyers and they'll make it happen for you. You, too, oh, can be man. a neoconquistador in the Pacific. Oh, man. Again, like. I didn't know that it was going to be like this with Larry Ellison, but here we are. Yeah. We should wrap it up here before we start to get actionable. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, we can I say mean, this. I'll, I will say, I'll say one thing. If I was going to decide how to punish Larry Ellison, I would um, trap him in the VR torture prison from Black Mirror <laughs> with an Oracle backend for the database. That's what I would do. We should have him go to, like, feudal Japan <laughs> as, as a, a, a Ronin just... <laughs> Put him out there on like one of the feudal highways and just say like, "Hey, man, figure it out. You you got this. Figure it out. You you like this shit, right? Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Done. Uh, uh, create a uh, create. Uh, use the same problem with the shogunate that you have with uh, you know, like uh, Bill Gates, and just see how he <laughs> see how he likes it. Yeah, simple as. Simple as. All right. Are we good? Sure. Yep. Sayonara. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> All right. Stay cool. Stay cool. <laughs> stay cool. There's a place I long to be. Ease my mind. Set my spirit free. How I wish I were there right now.